Okay, uh, my name is Edward Gage. I'm a research scientist in the Department of Forest and Rangeland Stewardship, Colorado State University. Uh, it was early interactions with a mentor as an undergrad at the University of Michigan, a forest ecologist uh, who just was a really talented field instructor and so gave me a taste of uh, plant ecology through a plant identification course and just really set my passions on fire. Uh, broadly interested in bringing new tools and technologies into land management and stewardship, uh, focusing specifically on remote sensing and GIS technologies. Uh, professionally, I'd say the most rewarding uh, single event I can think of is when I published my first scientific paper. Uh, it was based on work out of my master's degree and um, took several years and a lot of um, blood, sweat, and tears to produce, so it was very satisfying to finally get that published. Anyway, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Cooper. I'm a research scientist here. I've worked at CSU for 28 years, and I'm a recommended ecologist. I work all over the world, and I was asked to uh, introduce Ed. I first met Ed 20 years ago, 1999. He interviewed for a master's position I had working in the Rocky Mountain National Park on rural establishment. So Ed came and did his master's degree working in Rocky Mountain National Park and um, miraculously Ed published three journal articles from his master's, which is kind of a record from what I've ever seen in my life. Two were notes though, so. Well, they were, they were papers, you know, it takes just as much effort to publish anything. Uh, then Ed stayed as a research associate working on project, research projects with me for several years and then he did his PhD here as well, uh, working on urban ecology and urban hydrology. Kind of a big shift from natural area science to, to urban science, which is great. After his PhD, uh, Ed has stayed and developed uh, his own research program as a research scientist here and he's working on a variety of, of high-tech projects. He's really a master at technology. If I have any questions about how anything works, I always ask Ed first. So Ed's from Michigan, but he's lived in Colorado for more than 20 years. And loves this weather. It reminds me of home. <laughs> anyway, Ed Dave. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you for that great introduction, David. And thank you, Karina, and everybody for letting me uh, speak to you today. Um, as David said, I've been around here for a while. I did my uh, master's with David, early 2000s, looking at some of the same questions I'll be presenting here, uh, different aspects of it, I guess. But uh, And something that's happened over the course of my career, sort of not really on purpose, but uh, there's been a sort of a thematic element that's emerged of looking at uh, landscapes through th a three-dimensional lens. And uh, so that's what I'll be presenting today is looking at some tools and techniques uh, for looking at vegetation structure in three dimensions um, as it applies to riparian areas and a couple different uh, case studies. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so just a brief road map for the talk here. Uh, I realize we have a tight timeline and there's a happy hour at uh, 4.30 to catch here. So um, first thing I'm doing, I'm just going to define some basic concepts just so we're all on the same page. When I talk about vegetation structure, I'm talking about something specific in this talk rather than lots of other different viewpoints as to what that can be. And I'll also describe a little bit why it's important for ecology and as, uh, of riparian systems and, and as we'll see with the two case studies there's different applications uh, for different problems or, or systems. Uh, secondly I'll provide an overview of some basic remote sensing methods that's kind of the main toolbox I've been using as of late for uh, some of my studies and so there's a couple of different things that are out there in common use. I bet a lot of you already are using some of these, but uh, I'll provide an overview of some of the, the main tools. And then I'll present two case studies briefly. I was trying to chop things down to fit within this time frame, so fortunately I can't dive too deep into all the data, but uh, give you an overall impression of uh, how some of this structural data from remote sensing can be used to address management questions. And so the two places I'll be presenting on are Boulder County Parks and Open Space. This is the result of some work I did with some collaborators um, looking at riparian habitat structure in relation to Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse. 
And then uh, the second case study will be discussing uh, willow habitat structure. And there's a whole long backstory um, behind that. And so there, these methods and, and uh, approaches are very relevant for that area as well. So a little background, when I talk about vegetation structure, in this uh, talk at least, I'm going to be talking about the three-dimensional distribution of all the plant parts. So the leaves, the trunks, the branches, etc. cetera. Uh, basically all the parts of the vegetation that present themselves uh, in three dimensions. We could also talk about landscape pattern and structure and whatnot, but this is really going, going to be focused on the, the three-dimensional characteristics. And this is important for a whole variety of different uh, things, depending on the system you're working in. Uh, for upland forests, you know, it's a, it's a key variable in fuel loading, so it may have importance to managers as to fire management and the like. Uh, it's also important for wildlife habitat and uh, avian habitat. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of different specific species in these case studies for which habitat structure is really critical. Um, things like ha community composition, biodiversity, all of these things are influenced by the three-dimensional structural attributes. Um, aquatic systems, even indirectly in riparian areas, the amount and cover of uh, shrubs overhanging a river influence thermal conditions in the river and uh, aquatic habitat quality. So there's a whole slew of different things that are influenced by three-dimensional structure. Uh, hence why it's an important thing to be able to measure and monitor and affect through management. So how do we measure three-dimensional structure? There's a whole variety of ways, as you might imagine, and um, it depends on the application. Um, traditionally, it's been fairly difficult to do this just because the only way to really measure it has been through manual measurements, which are expensive, they're time intensive in the field, uh, can be challenging to uh, really come up with effective ways to sample across large landscapes. Remote sensing technologies have advanced over the decades, uh, providing a whole slew of new different tools we can use. Uh, I'll be talking primarily about LIDAR in this uh, talk here. There's also structure for motion, which is, uh, I don't know if anybody have any experience using either of these approaches. So structure for motion is uh, an exciting new technology that's kind of emerging operationally, but uh, it has LIDAR still probably the gold standard for a lot of things. So I'll be talking primarily about that. So I wasn't sure exactly people's background, didn't want to presume too much, so I figured I'd do a sort of brief intro or a primer on uh, LIDAR and its use and what it is. And, um, so light detection and ranging is where the acronym originated. Uh, it's kind of analogous to radar, but instead of radio waves, we're using uh, infrared light pulses typically. Uh, it's a form of laser scanning, a bunch of other approaches as well, I suppose, but um, that's the, the key aspect is it's, it's light rather than some other thing like sound or, or radio. It, the, the LiDAR system, and there's a whole variety of different technology behind this, but in general it's using light in the transit time of emitted pulses to, to measure that return strength and time to, to reconstruct a three-dimensional uh, surface. Or measure distance, but usually there's lots and lots of these points that are measured, and then collectively those are used to reconstruct uh, the three-dimensional properties of something, an interior of a room or the interior of a forest or if you're flying it from above a satellite or an airplane, maybe things on the ground. Uh, a key thing to note about LiDAR, it's an active remote sensing technology, so basically again there, there's an emitted signal that's put out and returned, so that this is different from a, a passive remote sensing approach. Uh, like optical imagery where you're essentially just uh, capturing with whatever's being reflected off you typically from the sun. So, And this has some big advantages, especially if you're trying to image underneath dense canopies. So this is why this has become a preferred method for uh, working, uh, especially in, in sort of dense forested areas. So there's uh, a bunch of different platforms and data types. So LiDAR in general can be terrestrial or it can be uh, acquired from above. So 
Uh, and as far as the different modes, uh, you know, manned aircraft is often how uh, at least larger areas are acquired. So that could be fixed wing aircraft uh, or helicopters. Uh, there are satellites that do uh, LIDAR analysis as well, uh, looking at, um, you know, obviously much broader scales typically looking at uh, forest growth or glacial ice patterns, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, more recently, you're seeing the uh, rollout of uh, LiDAR platforms on drones, which is pretty exciting. Unfortunately, I haven't had the budget in any of my projects to ever implement that. But uh, this is an example of a Velodyne sensor that can be mounted on one of these drones and used to uh, acquire data. And then this is a terrestrial laser scanner, so it's tripod mounted, um, but it, it, it shares with all of these other systems the basic concept and technology of using these emitted laser pulses to measure distance and, and reconstruct um, three-dimensional patterns. Uh, there's two general types that you might encounter of data, a discrete return or waveform LIDAR. And there's some new technologies being developed. All of what I'll be working with and presenting is this uh, discrete return, which is the sort of older uh, and most commonly sort of found type of data. And these, these aren't that different in, in their basic technology, just basically how that that return signal is processed. In the case of the discrete return, it does just that. It sort of focuses on the peaks in the, the return signal where the waveform sort of analyzes it as like a continuous function. So there's some more information that you can extract out of that waveform uh, type of data, but it's also more challenging from a processing standpoint. And so it's not something that's entered into my workflow as of yet. but. Uh, so to add a little intuition and just graphically give you a sense of what this looks like. So in this case, you can imagine there is an airplane or maybe a drone above here. And it's uh, emitting these laser pulses through this tree canopy and maybe this little sapling underneath there. Um, and this is an example of what graphically might be returned as far as the energy to the sensor after it's passed through uh, or reflected off of these different surfaces along the way. And so uh, this is what's being interpreted by, um, by the sensor and the, the processing algorithms to construct, ideally, these different elevations of things with, throughout the canopy, the difference, and then the ground surface. So this is another viewpoint uh, of that same kind of concept. So one laser pulse can hit multiple places along the way, including the ground. And so this is all information you can use as an analyst to uh, either if you're focused on the ground surface, which is often what you know many people are, you know, their interest starts and ends here at the ground. Uh, if you're a civil engineer doing flood modeling or something and you want a really accurate representation of the ground surface. Uh, a lot of time, this is what people are looking for is the bare earth. Uh, but as a vegetation ecologist, a lot of times what I'm interested in is what's on top of the ground. And so all this information, if you have the raw data, can be used to reconstruct both things like the, the canopy height, but also some attributes within the canopy itself. So it can be very useful. So where do you get LiDAR data? Um, it depends. If you have a lot of money, you can collect it yourself, or if you happen to have a, a drone with a LiDAR system. Um, it, traditionally, and well, up until the present too, it's, uh, it's quite expensive typically to acquire LiDAR for, uh, I forget how big uh, the Lulu City area is, but we recently collected some for a project and it was $25,000 for a really small footprint. I priced out my uh, study area when I was doing my PhD and not really talking to the, the Merrick person uh, who, uh, you know, the company that does the acquisition and he didn't realize I was a cash poor graduate student at the time, but just naively asking how much it was going to be for my study area. It was going to be over $100,000. So I'm like, I'll call you back. But uh, more commonly, and certainly for most of my analyses, you're using existing data uh, if you're lucky. And so that can come from different sources. It could maybe have been collected as part of some specific project and you have access to it. Um, doing my PhD work down in 
Aurora. Um, Aurora's part of the Denver Regional Consortium of Governments, Dr. Cog, so they, all a bunch of these cities, collectively pool resources and periodically every five, six years or so, uh, acquire new LIDAR data because it's very useful, especially for civil engineering applications. Um, they're also national repositories, so all the data I'll be presenting today is accessible for free to all of you uh, through the USGS and their 3D elevation uh, program. And there's also also resources like Open to, uh, Topography, which uh, archive different data sets. So um, if you're interested in working with LIDAR, you can find lots of data out there. Hopefully you can find it for your study areas. Um, so some of the different attributes of LIDAR data. Um, well, I mentioned X, Y, and Z coordinates. Again, it's at, at its heart, that's kind of what we're typically most interested in is these coordinates. And again, not for just one point, we're often looking at hundreds of thousands, millions, or billions of points. Uh, but there's other information that comes back to that sensor. So the intensity describes the amount of energy relative to what was originally emitted that's received back at the sensor. And so that can have some useful information tied up into it as well. Um, and then there are different uh, formats for encoding LiDAR data, but the, the, the standard formats that are used often have additional slots for classification type information. So you can have uh, LiDAR data that's been processed. This is an additional step beyond just the raw LiDAR data uh, to capture things like vegetation or ground or buildings. There's all these different codes that the uh, American Society for uh, Photo... I can never say that photogrammetry and uh, remote sensing puts out and they keep expanding this with each new version of the the file standard but long and short if you uh, are delivered data or can through your own processing do that you can add to the the point cloud data all of these different classification things and if, if you receive data that's already been processed like that it's pretty fantastic but often all you get is something that maybe has the ground points pulled out and then everything else, or maybe just the ground points and vegetation. But either way, uh, there's that potential to have all these other things associated with it. And uh, this isn't showing it here, but there's a bunch of empty slots too where you can attribute each one of those points in that point cloud with things like the red, green, and blue of an ortho image that was collected. So that's common too. When people are going to the expense of flying an airplane to acquire LIDAR, they're usually also acquiring imagery uh, or other multispectral data. So this is uh, the national map interface in the 3D elevation program. This is one of the routes you can access LIDAR data. Uh, and just like things like a, a 10 meter DM, you can find raw point cloud data if it's available. Um, not for every area. The actual coverage is somewhat limited uh, in, in large portions of the country. Um, it's the national map distributes data in a tiled format. One thing you'll realize if you haven't started working with LiDAR data before is these files tend to be quite large. Uh, so it poses a variety of challenges both for archiving and distribution as well as analysis. So pretty much all the approaches require you to sort of split that data into sort of digestible chunks. And that's what the 3D elevation program does for its distribution. Uh, you can download data, and they've recently been pushing uh, some cloud uh, Amazon Web Service uh, repositories that you can access if you want to work in that format. But, um, but it's a great interface, and it's, uh, if data are available, it's, um, they're constantly updating both the catalog as new data submissions are put into play and uh, some of the derivatives and whatnot that can be extracted from it. So. So this is a dated figure, but this is from the uh, from the uh, 3D elevation program, just showing the status of some of the different uh, you know where things have been collected. There's a bunch of different stuff, but again, look to see what you have available. All right, so analyzing lidar data. There's a lot of different tools. Um, which ones you want to use or can use are going to be a function of a bunch of different things. One's going to be what do you have access to. A lot of proprietary programs are out there that have lots of bells and whistles and are great to work with but are quite expensive so you may not have access to them. There's also a range of open source tools you can use. 
Uh, and if you're a user of ArcGIS, uh, they've been improving their support of LiDAR data too. So, so what you choose to use really is a function of what your goals are and what you have access to. Some tools are a little uh, more challenging to learn than others. Um, and then cost, of course, is a, another big issue. So, and it, if you're working with small amounts of data, you can kind of get away with just about any tool. Uh, some, of the, um, some of the software programs that have been developed that can work with really large data sets, uh, those tend not to be free because they're, they require uh, a little bit more engineering on the software developer side to, to, to work at those scales. Uh, so I, I've already mentioned a bunch of times a, a, a lighter point cloud. I mean, that's uh, even when I talk about structure for motion things, the point cloud in, is a vector representation of a bunch of individual points that have an X, Y, and Z. And so that's typically what we're working with with LiDAR, at least we're starting with that. Uh, the standard file format for that is a LAS file. Has anybody sort of encountered those? I know we'll, everybody's looking with LiDAR has. Um, they're really large formats. They're not very efficient in terms of how they store the data. So there have been some compressed file formats that have been developed. The most, um, I'd say most commonly used one is this LAZ format. It's just, again, it's analogous to what a zip file is. Uh, it's just a way of compressing that file size to more efficient format. Uh, relatively recently and somewhat controversially, uh, Esri came out with their own compressed file format, which is not open source. Um, so the developer of the LAZ format uh, started a whole little web protest, which was kind of amusing actually. But um, you may encounter either of these. Um, just realize if you're using the LASZ format that that is not open source. So. Uh, but often what you want to do, depends on your goal of course, uh, is to get from that point cloud data into a, a, a format where you maybe have an easier time analyzing, storing, etc. And these are usually raster files of one sort or another. It could be a GeoTIFF, an IMG file, whatever, uh, that represents some derived characteristic from that point cloud. Uh, you can always go back to the point cloud and analyze that, and there are certain types of analyses that can only be done on the point cloud, but it's not uncommon to try to get to, to, get to the uh, raster output and then bring that into a GIS, and it's a lot more easy to visualize and work with the data at that point. So speaking of LiDAR derivatives, um, I'll be speaking of several of these throughout the talk, and these are the most common sort of outputs. So a digital surface model is just basically, um, I love these graphs. These are all from the National Ecological Observatory Network. If you're looking for resources on LiDAR, they've got great stuff. Um, the, the thick line here is basically showing the surface model in this case. And so it, it incorporates both the variation in the terrain as well as the variation in the vegetation on top. So. Uh, a digital terrain model is basically just focusing on the ground surface. That's that bare earth uh, surface that a lot of people are interested in if they're doing, say, flood modeling or uh, any sort of topographic analysis. Now, one of the more useful things, especially as a, a plant ecologist, uh, is the canopy height model, or another way it's uh, referred to sometimes as a normalized uh, digital surface model, where basically you're just subtracting out the ground elevation from the digital surface model. So you're essentially zeroing out the, the variation in the ground elevation. And then you, what you're left with is just the height of the uh, features on top. So a canopy height model is, again, typically referring to vegetation. You could say that normalized digital surface model might include all of the features on top, so maybe buildings or whatnot too, but they're derived essentially the same way. So, so these are examples, uh, real world examples of, of this is a digital surface model, so you can see the, the contour and the saddle here and the elevation change. This is the bare earth surface, and this is after you difference the two, you have this flat is relative to the ground, and you can focus then on ana analyzing the vegetation height on top of that. And this is another example. Um, this is from some data, I where this is from Jefferson County, I think, but uh, 
Uh, this is about a one meter pixel size and you can see individual tree crowns here. So again, this is really information dense stuff. Um, it's really useful for a whole slew of different things. So I'm just going to mention structure for motion briefly here and then I've got I think a slide or two in there. But this is, as I mentioned, uh, kind of emerging technology and it has a lot of promise. It's already operationally being used in lots of context, uh, especially for topographic modeling. So it works great for uh, things like you know, stockpiles of earth uh, and whatnot. It has a little more, a little more difficulty with uh, vegetation, which I'll get into later. But uh, the basics of it is it's a photogrammetric technique that uses sets of overlapping images. And then the algorithm, which there's a bunch of different ones that have been developed, and some of them are proprietary, so it depends on the software you're using. Uh, but long and short of it, they're, they're using information in common across that, that pool of images to identify tie points, as uh, one term is you sometimes use, and then sort of re use that information, basically, just like your brain does in real time, to reconstruct three-dimensional um, relationships. Um, you can, depending on the software, you can bring in things like ground control points across those different images to sort of tie things together. But the output in the end is a point cloud similar to uh, something you'd get from a LiDAR sensor. Uh, depending on the conditions it was acquired in, sometimes the point density can be as, as good as LiDAR. My experience, somewhat limited, working with vegetation canopies is that it's not quite as good. And I'll get into some of the reasons there. But this is definitely an area of uh, emerging development here. In part because all you need is a camera, essentially, and, and a way to acquire those, those uh, images. So the first case study I'm going to present here, um, this was a, a study I did with some collaborators, uh, Dr. Jess Salo at the University of Northern Colorado, uh, Jason Stoker, who's uh, actually here in Fort Collins, and he runs the USGS 3D elevation program. Um, so he's got his fingers in all sorts of interesting projects across the country. And then uh, Gabrielle Katz at uh, Metro State University. So a little background and motivation for this particular study. Um, Boulder County Parks and Open Space is one of the biggest land managers in the region here. Um, manage quite a bit of land uh, and uh, quite a bit of riparian resources specifically. And one of the things they uh, have been dealing with, well, one in 2013, there were the, the floods that affected you know, much of the front range really did a, a number on a lot of their properties. So they've had a huge amount of issues, uh, both infrastructure but also e ecological systems were impacted. And so they've been trying to engage uh, all the resources they can pull together to do restoration and planning uh, to respond to these floods. Um, one of the things that occurs on um, many front range streams, but especially ones that the county owns, are populations of Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse, which is a federally threatened uh, subspecies of mouse. And so they're very interested in this species and maintaining its population and ideally, hopefully, expanding it. And one thing that's already known from years of, of analysis by biologists, wildlife biologists, based on field data, is that the species is strongly keyed into the structure of the riparian areas in which it occurs. So things like uh, shrub covers specifically, uh, as well as the complexity of the uh, vegetation canopy is an important thing. So the county was able to secure some money f uh, related to the post-flood stuff to do some planning work and so that's where we came into play was to try to develop some tools and information to help them sort of understand and uh, the structure and plan uh, things like management and restoration of their riparian resources specifically as it relates to the uh, Preble's mouse and more generally as well. So our specific study objectives, um, first and foremost, was just to sort of characterize the nature of riparian structure along streams in the county. So this wasn't just limited to uh, properties the county owned. Um, they own quite a bit of land, but obviously there's lots of private land, there's other land managers, et cetera. 
And one of the great things about remote sensing data is that often it's available uh, synoptically across broader landscapes. So we took advantage of that. Um, another objective was to try to develop some framework for incorporating uh, future remote sensing data acquisition, so to facilitate comparisons of change, whether it's recovery or degradation, uh, and also something that could uh, facilitate field sampling. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So using uh, 3D structure and other explanatory variables, we also sought to develop some habitat models so we could understand, we know where there are occurrences of the mouse, but we also wanted to identify where else on the landscape uh, suitable prebles habitat might occur and uh, maybe sort of relate that information into some analyses of, whoop, come back here, uh, of habitat connectivity and restoration because one of the things they want to uh, ensure is that populations of the, the mouse are able to expand as needed. Uh, also it might influence land acquisition and those kinds of things. So. So this is the study area. This is Boulder County as a whole here, uh, based on the county's uh, specifications and the grant. Uh, we worked below 7,600 feet. So basically, you can think of the peak-to-peak -peak highway if you're familiar with the area. Everything below that. And then we did some just basic modeling using just the 10-meter DM to sort of define a study area, which is this red area, based on some geomorphic characteristics. And again, this was meant purposely to be fairly broad in scope. So this is, uh, doesn't describe, like all of these areas are not truly riparian in, in character. Uh, but one of the things you find, especially on the plains here too, there's lots of ditches and canals and whatnot too. And prebles occurs on those features. Uh, so including a more expansive area was uh, useful for a variety of things. So some of the data. We used, um, and you'll see this in the next case study as well, as I mentioned often, you work with the data you have access to. So one of the things that happened after the flood in 2013 is that uh, FEMA, and I believe the state of Colorado ponied up some money as well, acquired data for a very large area throughout the South Platte River drainage because so many areas were affected by the flood. So those data are available and, and usable by anybody through the 3D elevation program. They're all 2013, so they're not exactly contemporary, but uh, you use what you got, right? So it's the best data we had. So we processed those data, uh, the raw point cloud data, using last tools in R to produce a bunch of derivatives, which I'll describe. For comparison, we did in some point locations, we used a terrestrial laser scanner. So I mentioned that in the introductory so slide. So the department owns this uh, Ferro Focus 120. It's a tripod mounted device that kind of rotates around and has a rotating mirror that emits the laser and, and receives the, the return signals. And it's kind of a magical piece of equipment. Um, these data are just like the airborne LIDAR data in the sense it's a point cloud data, um, usually as a LAS file. We clip these down just for comparison purposes to a point, uh, to a cylinder, if you will, 100 meters in area around each of the uh, collection points and then use that for comparison purposes. And then in a couple of locations, uh, we did some structure for motion analysis as well to sort of compare how these things uh, shaped up to one another. And for that, we used an Inspire 2 um, drone, which is this guy here. And then PIX4D is a software program. There's several others that are out there, but it's one of the uh, bigger or more common ones uh, for taking all of those images and producing from that the point cloud data. That can then be compared and analyzed using the same tools you would use for the TLS or airborne data. So we were interested, so those were sort of comparison, methods comparisons. Uh, this is sort of more getting at that landscape scale. Uh, where we produced a bunch of derivatives. Um, from a point cloud, again, you can produce the canopy, the maximum canopy height, but you can also do things like height above ground uh, percentiles that give you some insight into how points above, vertically above the ground are distributed. And so that can give you some uh, insights into how canopy structure uh, 
varies in, in different dimensions. Uh, we also looked at basic things like tree and shrub cover and density. And from these derivatives, we did some just basic continuous analyses and, and data products that were provided to the county for their own uses. Uh, so single band things that could be, for instance, uh, maximum canopy height. We also did some multi-band uh, representations. One of the neat things you can do with all of these different LiDAR derivatives, just like you can do a false color image uh, by substituting in color in, uh, near infrared for red to make a, a false color, uh, you know, color infrared type thing, you can do that with different LiDAR bands and sort of see different patterns in the vegetation. So it's, it's a qualitative, but it's still a powerful way to sort of explore pattern and, and structure across a landscape. And we also, just for some analyses, we tried to do some data reduction techniques using uh, PCA, just to sort of take all of these different derivatives and kind of distill them down into some basic uh, characteristics. And I'll get, those are applied more for the modeling type things I'll talk about. Um, as a complementary approach, especially getting at the goals of uh, establishing a monitoring framework and, and sort of repeat things. We, we did sort of a discrete representation of structure where we did a tessellation, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying we gridded out um, all of our study area. And then we uh, extracted the raster values representing different structural attributes to those each one of those sampling units. And then we did things like a cluster analysis to try to see the natural groupings among them and, uh, and various other ways of just presenting that data in that way. Um, and I'll describe that more when I show you some of the results. Uh, for that habitat modeling, again, we're using mostly the airborne LIDAR data and uh, the derivatives produced from that. Uh, we did a species distribution modeling exercise where we basically try to model using all the known occurrence data uh, where Prebles has been found through the trapping that Fish and Wildlife Service and Boulder County Parks and Open Space Wildlife people have been doing for uh, many years now. Uh, we use those data and fit some different species distribution models to try to develop predictive models that we could then bring into connectivity analyses because that was one of the key things they were interested in is, okay, so where is uh, you know, patches of potentially suitable habitat, perhaps that's not occupied, that could be part of um, their management. Uh, this is, I'm not even sure this is complete here. There was a bunch of different derivatives we used. Some of these uh, machine learning algorithms are fairly uh, uh, generous as far as the ability to sort of put a hopper full of data into it. Uh, a lot of these are, you would imagine, are uh, sort of highly correlated, but they get at different aspects of structure. So everything from, you know, the, the maximum height above ground derived from the airborne LIDAR, uh, to things like the, the height above ground standard deviation. So how much variability within from the max to the min was there? Um, and then derived things related to the topography, because again, we're, what we're trying to do is not so much uh, figure out all the specifics of, of what the mouse wants habitat-wise, because wildlife biologists have already l largely identified those characteristics, but come up with just a good predictive map of, of potential habitat. So things like topography, you know, would l logically have some influence on where you find that the mouse. Um, we also used some multispectral imagery and the LIDAR to do a classification into just a basic land cover. So we had uh, everything from, you know, impervious and irrigated agriculture to riparian forests, but this was like a, a uh, you know, just a standard land cover classification. So that was used as a data layer. And then we also had uh, different masks layer, and then this will be important, uh, and as I'll show you in a bit here, um, this Euclidean distance to stream. So all places within the, the spatial domain that we were modeling, we, we just calculated the distance to the closest stream or ditch. Since the mouse is an obligate uh, riparian species, it always occurs near water. So I'm just going to blaze through these, but because they're not even really all that interpretable, but this is, you know, the, the study area, and so we had all these different layers, this topographic wetness index, a bunch of different things. We just, these are just 
some examples. Uh, height above ground, standard deviation, etc. So these were all just put into the hopper to uh, drive the model. So, uh, so back to the discrete analysis I mentioned. So this is the, uh, the format we used. We used hexagonal grids. There's, a, there's only three geometric shapes you can use to completely subdivide an area without gaps, squares, triangles, or hexagons. These have some nice properties, especially if you're trying to think of field sampling or, for instance, going out in the center of one of these and putting a TLS unit. So that was the, why, uh, the reason why we chose the uh, hexagon. Plus, they look kind of cool. Um, and so we created, I mean, across our total spatial domain, we had over 90,000 of these things. Now, each one of these, again, has, through uh, zonal statistics, these were just calculated in ARC. We, uh, we pulled out the information about height above ground, the proportional land cover, all the different things that we had calculated prior to that. Um, any ideas on what these might be here? Power lines, yeah, exactly. So we had to do some cleaning and filtering, but and you can actually see those right there too. So that's one of the things with LIDAR data, again, it doesn't typically tell you what it is, it's just giving you the structure, so you have to kind of do some cleaning. But, but this gives you some general sense of what this kind of looks like across our study area. Uh, we removed areas that had like buildings or roads in them because we were again focused on areas where the mouse might occur or where they're likely to be doing uh, any management. And then so we looked at just a k-means clustering um, and we ended up just creating four cluster groups based on this um, relationship as the number of clusters were added. Again, this was just a descriptive way to try to simplify or distill down all of these dimensions of variability. So continuous analyses, I mentioned the output of a lot of these uh, algorithms are continuous raster surfaces. So this is an example of what I was talking about where you can substitute into the red, green, blue slots of your monitor um, different types of data. So in this case, we had the 95th percentile height above ground, the uh, standard deviation and cover. This is along, uh, was this Western Mobile, so this would be St. Vrain Creek uh, near Longmont. But you can see quite a bit of distinction between and within the riparian corridor as to structure and stuff. So it's, um, and we have a bunch of different derivatives. We basically tried to give the county anything and everything we could think that might be useful since they had some specific questions, but more broadly, we're just trying to give them information they can use uh, for a variety of purposes. So getting into the um, habitat modeling and the, the species distribution modeling, one of the values of the approaches we used is uh, the production of these variable importance plots. Um, these are analogous, I guess, to maybe the regression coefficient in a more traditional regression context. They just give you some indication of how important a particular variable or suite of variables is to uh, the prediction surface that uh, is being created. And unsurprisingly, when you think about it, as I mentioned, the mouse is a riparian obligate. The distance to stream is the most important thing. Uh, so we did two different analyses. We, we for, for the predictive model that we used for our connectivity analysis, we didn't really care about opening the black box in any way. We just wanted the best model we could um, for prediction. But we also were interested in trying to unpack you know, some of the structural contributors to model performance. So we pulled out the Euclidean distance to stream uh, variable just so we could see how some of these other variables, because when you have that in there, that, that drives the prediction surface, because all the occurrences of the mouse are right along streams or canals. So it's unsurprising. When you do that, you can see some other things. Well, the classification is important, which kind of makes sense as well, because one of the attributes of that is um, is riparian forest, for instance, and so that kind of information uh, gets pulled into. But you can also see the uh, elevation, which makes sense because the mouse is primarily down at low elevations, although it gets into the foothill streams as well. But then you can see, depending on which model, this is boosted regression trees, this is random forests. Um, you know, they use different variables differently, but things like the height above ground standard deviation had some predictive value. 
um, canopy height measures, et cetera. So these, again, just are ways of trying to understand in a pretty coarse way uh, what's driving the, the prediction surface. So this is a atrocious color scheme, but, uh, but you get some sense of how this shapes out. So you can, anywhere you're seeing that fuchsia or purple, those are primarily streams or ditches, as you can imagine. But not all streams or ditches are predicted to have the same habitat quality, and some of that's coming, again, from the structure characteristics. So in zooming into a sort of more focal area here, so this is about you know, 800 meters across. You can see within that there are definitely areas primarily based on the, the vegetation structure, uh, the presence of, of vegetation, um, where you're seeing higher predicted habitat value. So applying this in that more discrete framework again, so we're used back to using those hexagons here, you can see how uh, this sort of shapes up here. So these are our different clusters that came out of that cluster analysis. So this is just one way of representing the variability in structure across the landscape. The advantage of this is if you want to use this for some stratified sampling approach, for instance, you could say, all right, I want to have 200 in each one of these clusters and then use that as a sampling framework to go to. This is using that same framework. Now we're just representing these continuous raster uh, values that had been extracted to them. So in this case, this is the 90th percentile height above ground. This is the cover. This is the standard deviation of height above ground. So you can see all the different ways you could kind of uh, represent the same data. This is a bivariate plot with normalized cover on the x-axis and the normalized standard deviation of the height above ground on the y-axis. We have lots of these because there were lots of different variables, of course, but this is just showing you as one example of how these different clusters broke out. I'm not sure this is necessarily the most useful framework, but it just gives you a sort of sense of uh, the various ways you can kind of work with these data. And, uh, and an advantage of this approach specifically is that all of these different things are queryable. So, you know, these are all different things that have been extracted to each one of those hexagons. So you can set up different uh, queries to look for ones. And this is how we identify some potential sites for restoration. Uh, sites nearby rivers that uh, had low vegetation cover and uh, little structural variability, those are potential sites for maybe doing some planting, for instance. So, so this is an example um, of a, a colorized uh, point cloud produced by the structure for motion. So this was one of the properties that we imaged uh, up in the foothills. And you can see we were into the fall when we finally got permission to actually do the image acquisition, which was a problem. Um, just because it already dropped a bunch of leaves, so that made some problems. But this technique works amazingly well for like terrain, uh, but when you get into looking at the specifics of, of actual plant canopies, it can be a little less satisfying, at least under these image uh, acquisition uh, conditions. And this is an example of uh, how we took for those 100 meter plots or square meter plots. These are just looking at extracts of the ALS, or sorry, ALS data that we compared to the TLS point clouds. And then we looked at things like, okay, how did the canopy height or the distribution of points compare between the structure for motion produced point cloud, the TLS, or the, um, or the airborne LIDAR. So just quick comparisons of how things shook out. The TLS level of detail hands down, it was the highest point density. Because you can imagine, you, you're putting this laser scanner on the ground and you're collecting a billion points or whatever just around a you know, 100 meter radius around that. So it's, it's very high point density, whereas the airborne LIDAR was on average two to three points per square meter. So still very high information density, but not, nowhere close to what the TLS produces. Um, structure for motion produced very dense point clouds, but they missed a lot of stuff. And yeah, the, point, the quality of the point clouds were not very high. But the you know, size of the files was large. I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, as far as accuracy, 
the TLS is probably the gold standard if it's acquired uh, you know, properly just because of the information density. But it's comparable to ALS. I think there's some slight biases with the airborne LIDAR just because of that lower point density. But it's also very uh, rigorously collected and also has the advantage of being collected from a, you know, a consistent perspective in terms of it's above. And then you can, you know, whereas with the TLS, as you move away from the scanner, the point density decreases. So it's, it's got some challenges. This, the structure for motion for this particular comparison was not satis satisfactory for any real useful uh, analysis. However, the imagery was good, just the, the 3D models were not so good. Um, so a lot of different factors can influence these, and I'll talk a little bit more on the next case study as well. But uh, how the data were collected, leaf on, leaf off. So all the airborne LIDAR data was collected after primarily the, the leaves had dropped from the trees. Uh, the sensor type, so there's a bunch of different types of LIDAR sensors. Two points per square meter is actually pretty low compared to what new uh, LIDAR hardware is producing these days. Likewise, with the terrestrial scanners, there's all different types of devices out there now. So, And then with the structure for motion, you can think of all of the different things that influence how the imagery was collected. So uh, what was the camera on the drone? What was the height that you flew the drone? How many overlapping pictures? And what flight path did you use, et cetera? So all of these things can influence the quality, level of detail, et cetera. So some just general conclusions, and these kind of apply to the next one to a certain degree as well, is that you know, remote sensing analyses can be very useful because they give you context you just can't get from plot-based sampling. Or you maybe can, but with great, great effort and cost. So, um, and, but, but typically, I think its best role is not sort of as a standalone analysis, but as a complementary thing to the kinds of things you can get out of field work um, that are difficult to get out of remotely sensed products. So, um, let's see, the SDM was not a perfect product, but it was an ends to a means, which was sort of looking at connectivity and, and overall landscape patterns. So it was, it had some issues, like there were issues with the occurrence data, as far as how specific they were, a lot of them were sort of snapped to streamlines. So I think that was one of the things that influenced the importance of that variable. Um, and likewise, not a, a substitute for on the ground, uh, boots on the ground work. All right, so where am I doing time-wise here? So the next case study here um, I'll be talking about is looking at uh, willow riparian structure in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, different management context, uh, different ecosystems, but similar set of technical um, approaches with some differences here. So give you a little bit of background on, I imagine most of you are somewhat familiar or maybe very familiar depending on uh, your, your background. I know Karina, you lots of time with this here, but uh, Rocky Mountain National Park um, has had a lot of changes over its history from the park's creation in 1915. Uh, even before the park was created, I believe wolves were extirpa extirpated, grizzlies were extirpated, uh, elk were extirpated. Uh, they were reintroduced after the park was uh, founded, but managed under uh, fairly, um, fairly rigorous management plan as far as the, the, the population sizes until the late 1960s when park service wide uh, the, the MPS adopted a natural regulation paradigm for ungulates like elk. And so both in Rocky and places like Yellowstone, uh, unsurprisingly, without any predators to check their uh, population sizes, the uh, populations of elk and um, other herbivores went through the roof. And it took some time. There were some people early on who were making observations about some degradation and ecological impacts within specifically riparian areas and other communities like uh, Aspen communities. But it took decades of research. Um, I was one data point as far as one, one master student of many who did work related to trying to identify this, the constellation of, of impacts and issues related to these changes in elk 
and herbivore numbers, um, which the Park Service eventually used to sort of develop a, uh, a management plan. So one of the, the big consequences of the expansion of elk populations was a degradation of willow communities and asthma communities, which are the primary food source for beaver, which are ecological uh, engineers, is one term you sometimes hear. They have a disproportionate effect on the functioning of landscapes through their foraging, but specifically their dam building activities. So they're a critical um, part of the natural uh, history of all of these riparian landscapes. And they almost completely disappeared from Rocky, other than a few uh, locations. When I started working there in the late 1990s, I think there were just a couple of places where um, they were still building dams and doing their work. So that's been a big focus for the park. Oh, here's a photo from the archive. So this is Moraine Park, if anybody's familiar, east side uh, core elk winter range. And this is David, uh, circa 2000, with, um, I forget how old this willow was, I think it was about 60, 70 years old, only showing about 10 centimeters of above ground um, you know, height to the, the willows. Each year, the, the, the elk would come in and just browse it down to the ground, and it would shoot up you know, new shoots each year. But um, it was just ba barely hanging on, basically. And so this, this describes the condition of a lot of the willows, uh, specifically in, in Moraine Park and Beaver Meadows and some of those areas. Um, and this is, in part, what motivated the, the park to, uh, to, to really research and then eventually address through management these issues. So now that it's even more complicated, unfortunately. I mean, they, they, after they did all this work focused on elk, uh, this is one of David's students. Uh, Christian Kaczynski, who worked over uh, primarily on the west side of the park, looking at um, declines in willow condition. And um, she identified and really looked at this Cytospora fungus, which is um, kind of a ubiquitous fungus, but it seems to uh, be affecting these willow communities independent or in conjunction with uh, the herbivory pressure to contribute to the dieback in a lot of these willow uh, communities. So, and then moose are expanding. So they're kind of uh, a new-ish threat. They were reintroduced by the Division of Wildlife, or maybe introduced for the first time. I think that's somewhat controversial as to whether they're even native to this area. But they've been expanding their range and their population sizes have been expanding. And uh, they can eat quite a bit, as you can imagine. Um, and then you have other factors, too, that are also affecting the condition of riparian areas in the park, such as uh, ditches. This is the Grand Ditch over on the uh, west side of the park. Climate change, always there. So the park has been interested in riparian condition. Uh, what are the trends? What can we do from a management perspective? So <clears throat> this kind of tells uh, a story right here that this is over on the west side. These are all photos David took. Starting in 1995, you can see these willows are looking pretty good. Things are not looking as good here. You get to 2017, most of these willows are dead or gone. So, so there's some problems. Um, and so, again, back to, I think, one of the first slides where why is canopy structure important? Well, in the case of Rocky, it's important for all the things I mentioned. Um, but it's uh, really especially important for beaver habitat. And so they have a big interest in restoring the condition and cover of willow across landscapes. And that's the big motivation for this study. So this is in 2008, they had a, published a record of decision after a, a lengthy research and uh, environmental uh, impact statement process. And as part of this plan, they had, uh, in addition to building a bunch of fences, doing some lethal and non-lethal uh, elk control, a variety of other things, is extensive monitoring. So. Uh, the Elk Vegetation Management Plan, EVMP, um, we're actually analyzing those data right now for the Park Service. But um, every five years, and then on a rotating panel, they go around and they, they examine, among other things, willow structure. And they do that through manual measurements. So 
the study objective here is can any of these uh, remote sensing based approaches, specifically the airborne LIDAR and terrestrial LIDAR, it's very difficult to fly drones in national parks, so we didn't propose structure for motion, but uh, can these be used uh, to complement some of their uh, sampling approaches? So specifically we wanted to look at the strengths and limitations of the TLS unit for looking at riparian willow structure and then compare, compare these where available because unfortunately the park doesn't have full airborne LIDAR coverage uh, yet. So hopefully at some point they will get it. But where we did have the two, compare those. And then try to evaluate some different uh, strategies for incorporating these data with their already existing uh, monitoring program. So, so we worked in three different areas, um, Wild Basin, Moraine Park, and Kawanichi Valley. Um, these were chosen, one, in part because of access, and two, because they represent a pretty uh, natural gradient of condition. So Moraine Park is probably the most hammered of all the sites. That's where those photos were from earlier. Uh, there was even a golf course at one point before the park took it over. So the, the, the habitat character is mostly grass and really short hedged willows, Kawanichi Valley has a mix of stuff depending on where you're at in the valley. A lot of areas have also been uh, severely impacted, but there are also some areas that have uh, more intact, although it seems to be kind of falling apart as those last that photo sequence sort of illustrated. Wild Basin is sort of the end point. It's the best of what's left, at least for these montane riparian areas in the park, and so we wanted to make sure we collected some data in those areas. And so again, this the whole idea was to get a, a range of riparian conditions. So, so we took a subset of scan locations to um, overlap these different data sets. Because um, in addition to the, the remote sensing data, there's also the elk vegetation monitoring uh, plan plots. These are, I believe, the uh, green guys here. And then there's uh, also the inventory and monitoring program that the National Park Service has. Uh, they have a bunch of uh, points located around the, uh, around the uh, park as well, and so we tried to co-locate some stuff there. So this is the TLS unit in action. And uh, so this is how we process the data. I'm not going to get into all the details there, but the, the end goal, again, is to get to one of these point cloud files that we can then compare. And one of the challenges with the TLS is sort of co-registering different scans. So this is what each one of these is a different scan. That little donut hole is the tripod where it stood. So this is looking from above. And the whole idea is to construct one common uh, point cloud from that. So I've just distilled all the results into some pretty general uh, uh, results here, conclusions. The TLS in general uh, does a really good job of, of capturing the manual measurements as far as height, within five centimeters on average for the scans we analyzed of the maximum willow height. Some spatial components that are a little hard to nail down, but so at a plot level at least, does a very good job. Um, compared to the, the airborne LIDAR, the uh, TLS generally had a higher peak canopy height, and that's in part because of the point density. If you only have two points per square meter, the, the likelihood that, that one of those two points will hit the highest point on a plant is not necessarily that high, so that wasn't too surprising. And this is looking at the airborne LIDAR and wild basin. You can get a sense at a landscape scale how useful these data can be. All these areas here are much taller willows than over here where the beaver have mowed them down. Um, Ignore these water areas here. So again, it's a really powerful tool, especially as they get more airborne lighter. I think this will be the most, airborne lighter will be the most useful thing, but TLS is, is a good tool as well. So just, I know we're out of time here, so some just quick uh, strengths and weaknesses of the different approaches. One of the great things about the manual measurements, they're slow, they're inefficient, but there's all sorts of things you can measure while you're standing over a plot you can't with an airborne uh, image, for instance. For instance, what kind of 
plant is it exactly? All you can tell from the airborne stuff is maybe it's a shrub. Maybe you can tell it's a willow versus uh, a birch, but you can't necessarily tell the type of willow. You have to actually be looking at the plant. And there's also things like how much herbivory or whether it's infected or whether maybe there are some beaver cut stems. Those are all observations you can make in the ground. But the big limitation, again, is it takes field crews a lot of time to collect data on these plots, time intensive. So, so the TLS um, you know, gives you really high resolution. Processing is a bear, but it's, um, it gives you a nice perspective. So it's a nice complement to those uh, field measurements. And then the airborne LIDAR, again, if you have it, it's great. Unfortunately, only certain portions of the park have data, so that's a big limitation. But, uh, but as with the first case study, you have a lot of flexibility in how you analyze that. So management implications, um, this kind of not just Rocky specific, this is uh, for sort of any application. You've got to figure out what the scale, spatial resolution, the temporal resolution, how often do you need data collected? Airborne LIDAR is very expensive, but TLS you could go out there regularly, for instance. So. So this sort of just reiterates some of what I've already said. The TLS is a great gold standard. The airborne LIDAR is probably, the, if you have it, the best thing you can use because you can analyze broad landscapes. But it, you know, in all cases, this technology is rapidly developing. So um, you know, even though a TLS unit is too expensive for the park now, five years time, maybe it's something they could actually buy. Um, so, sorry, that was a mouthful there, but uh, just some quick acknowledgments here. Uh, these are some of the Boulder County Parks and Open Space folks that were helpful in the study, and these are some of the uh, Rocky Mountain National Park people that helped. Any questions? <laughs> sorry, I'm cutting into happy hour here. <laughs> Yeah, the, the main issue I think with the structure for motion, and again, by the time we were able to actually acquire data, and this was largely due to permitting issues, um, it was kind of in the middle of the fall, and so leaves were falling. So one, the question was, well, what does this represent? But more generally, I think the issue with the structure for motion, just, I mean, you, you could tell looking at the models that the, the output wasn't totally accurate, because it would miss portions of the canopy or whatnot. I think the issue with structure for motion is it needs, the algorithms need to be able to identify tie points in common across that population of images that are collected. So we had a, a dense, you know, bin of images to work with. It's just the algorithms had a hard time in places identifying the common points across those photos just because of the complexity of tree canopies. Like, you know, doing a stockpile of, of dirt is really straightforward for these algorithms. They produce amazing results. But when you get into all the complexities and the shadows and the, maybe the wind's blowing and maybe a leaf drops midway through the flight, et cetera, that it just, it wasn't, Again, I think you could probably improve the accuracy by uh, finessing the acquisition characteristics and, and not doing it in the middle of fall. I think that's another big thing. But, um, but my general sense is, having tried this even with just like handheld cameras and imaging individual shrubs, is that just the geometry is really complex for a plant canopy compared to a pile of dirt, let's say. So, so it's, it's going to be hit or miss. Maybe that will improve over time. Maybe the image acquisition and processing parameters can be improved, but um, it wasn't super satisfactory as far as the outcome. But the imagery is great, so you know, combine that with some other source too. It's, it's not that the, the drone doesn't have utility, I just I wasn't sold that this was a good solution for them. But. <laughs>